Milwaukee Public Television is proud to present Next Avenue Community Conversations. Next Avenue brings baby boomers and beyond smart, useful information and compelling perspectives. Our goal is really quite simple, to provide provocative information that makes your life more meaningful and enjoyable. Next Avenue is made possible with funding from the Helen Daniels Bader Fund, a Bader philanthropy, enhancing the quality of life of older adults and addressing issues affecting those with Alzheimer's disease. On this episode, how participating in the creative arts can help keep your brain young as you age. We are coming to you from the Fine Arts Theater on the beautiful campus of the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan. Now here's your host, Mark Segrist. And it's great to be here in Sheboygan, beautiful Sheboygan. Now, let me just ask you from the get-go, have you ever considered at this stage of your life as a baby boomer, suddenly learning the piano, picking up a paintbrush and making a broad stroke, creative uh, stroke across an empty canvas? Or perhaps getting the courage to step on stage during an audition and trying out for a favorite part in a community production? All forms of self-expression. But you know, when it comes to creative arts, enjoying the creative arts, embracing them, it's really more than a cultural experience. It's a chance to enrich, to stimulate our minds, our body, and our souls. And that's the focus of our next 30 minutes here at MPTV. We're to be discussing just that. But if we choose to embrace the creative arts, particularly as baby boomers at this stage of our lives, how do we get started? How do we know we have the talent to choose anything in the form of creative art? And once we choose it, how do we make it become a daily part of our lives. So, to help us address that, we've invited three very gifted and talented uh, faculty members here from UW Sheboygan, and it's my pleasure to introduce them to you right now. We're joined, first of all, by Dr. Thomas Campbell. He is Assistant Professor of Communications and Theater Arts. We're also joined by Dr. Christy Talbot, Assistant Professor of Music, and Tom Abel here is Professor of Art. How, how fun to have all of you here with us. Thank you so much. Uh, we enjoyed chatting a little bit in the foyer before we started our discussion here uh, tonight. But I'd like to start off here on a very personal level, if I may. Thomas, you know, when you began to become involved as a young man in theater production, as a playwright, as an actor, as a director, what drew you to it and how has it fulfilled your life? Starting off with softballs. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think. Initially, um, I, I started as a performer. I started in, 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 I was in my first show when I was six. Um, but six didn't, years old. Yeah, I was a lost boy in Peter Pan. I don't want to brag about it, but. Um, <laughs> that had to be, that had to be wonderful. It was uh, terrifying. I, I remember a lot of anxiety actually associated with it. Um, it um, and, and, you know, anxiety is something that, you know, I've had on and off throughout my life. but. Um, I really started to, to get into it in, in junior high and high school. And I think initially what I thought was fun, I, I later realized it was, a, it was a safe place for me. It was, uh, it was a, a, an environment where I could uh, express myself. I could be silly without judgment. I could be serious uh, and have people listen to what I had to say. Um, I wrote my first play as a senior in high school. I had wow. great, I had a fantastic teacher who encouraged me to do that, actually forced me to do that. Yeah. Um, and and uh, so having the, those opportunities to, to be self-expressive um, was, was really encouraging. And later I found out that I could actually say things, the important things about the world around me. And um, I could have other people come and share that experience with me. And I mean, so theater was really part of the, your formation of life itself. Yeah, absolutely, especially as an adolescent yeah. and growing up in, in uh, an environment where you have a bunch of a, a, a really diverse group of people from a variety of different backgrounds coming together and really living within a community. And so a lot of times, you know, adolescents are, are may feel a little wayward mm -hmm. in a high school setting or just as, you know, Everybody's been a teenager, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, so having a, a home within a, a, an institutional structure mm -hmm. was incredibly important to me. Christy, your, your discipline is uh, musical theory, direct the choral here. I know the students l love performing for you. You also embrace the community. You, you organize an annual event where 
uh, various uh, music instructors from all levels of education participate in, in your program. How has it touched your life? How has it made you a fulfilled person? Well, it's a great question because we often think that as performers in music that everybody kind of feels the same thing or comes from the same perspective. And as I tell my students, we all come from different perspectives, whether I sing with a soprano voice or you sing with a bass voice or you play the ukulele and perhaps I play the bassoon. It doesn't really matter. The fact is that we all come as individuals to express music together. It's a communal activity. Um, you can just study through the ages, whether it's involved with dance or theater, music is a communal activity. So for me personally, I grew up in a musical family. So musical, in fact, that um, my mother was a church organist for 75 years. And when we came from the womb, I hope I can say that, when we came from the womb, it was expected that we would sing harmony in my family. It just was. So it it was, just was. It was assumed. Right. So I sang alto from the time I was very, very young. And I was in a junior choir at church. And then when I was 14, I was asked to direct the, the church choir. And I thought that was the easiest thing in the world. So I think you're just attracted to things that come easily for you to do. But we're all singers. Whether you're 55 or 75 or five, we are all singers. We, we all know? have that within we us. We all have a voice. We, I mean, imagine all of us at age two, we are all singing. And we're all having a wonderful time doing Why that. Why are we necessarily singing on tune? Well, that's part of what you want. You can learn okay. to do that. That's perfectly fine. And one thing we want to encourage is those who think they can't sing. Because very often, people, unfortunately, people have been told they can't sing. And it's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful to bring people in who think they can't sing. It's a wonderful um, ab ability for us in this environment, in this collegial environment. Because once that light comes on that they realize they really can do more than they believe. Mm -hmm. That's a really wonderful experience. And Tom, I am told that your studio here on campus is a very busy place. So you've got a lot of different things going on at once. Um, sculpturing, drawing, sketching, painting, digital art. Uh, what's a typical day like in your studio? It depends on what day of the week it is because it's always a different schedule. But uh, on, uh, on Mondays, it's... Uh, Photography in the morning, uh, followed by a drawing in the evening. As a matter of fact, my drawing class is here tonight. How wonderful. <laughs> it's great to have them with us. So. Now, as an instructor, though, how do you make that transition from one medium to another during the course of a year? Well, to put it in the nutshell, it's all the same process with different materials. It's all expression. Yeah. You learn the different materials. The, idiosyncrasies of the different materials, but the process remains the same. Explain that to me. The process remains the same. The, well, the, the thought process, the, the vision? You become familiar with the uh, principles of design, the elements of, uh, uh, the elements of design, how to use the materials, how paint, different paints react in different ways. Different. Once you learn the tools, how to use them, um, we're looking for a unique form of self-expression. What, uh, what can you do that nobody else has done before? So a good materials? artist. Whether it's, whether it's photography or stone carving or welding. So a good artist is expressing his or herself, should be able to, in various ways, capture a thought yep. and express it in various ways, whether yep. it's sculpturing or whether it's... But how do you, but is it easier to let go and attempt to do that as a younger person or as a mature baby boomer, uh, is it too late to even have the desire to do something like that? Well, they say the, the oldest part of the brain is the, the hippocampus and that's the part of the brain that's been with us since birth. Uh, and the most intuitive, uh, impulsive, spontaneous ideas come from that area, uh, which they're still there for us, uh, that part of the brain. Um, you know, ideas like, you know, what would happen if you put a bicycle wheel on a stool? Uh, is it sculpture? Uh, that's always there. It's right. been there since we were born, and it's still there. Now, Christy, you were explaining to me earlier that when a soloist is performing, performing for you, he or she is thought processes on 
as, as Tom was describing a moment ago, but only in, in the musical discipline, on very, very many different levels. Interpretation of the music, understanding the music, translation, explain that to me. Right, so especially if you're just learning materials, whether it's a soloist or somebody singing in an ensemble or playing in an ensemble, you're reading a score, and essentially a musical score is a foreign language. And for those of us who sing, we also have text that may or may not be in a foreign language. And for those in choral ensembles, you're generally singing in two or three or more languages. So there's the process of that. There's also the concentration that comes from a different part of the brain to be able to read the score and encompass everybody that's going on, everything that's going on around you. You are making physical changes in your body to make sure that you are in line in terms of timbre and dynamics and you're conforming to what's going on in a choral group. So a soloist would do something a little different. They would want to perform something um, a little more isolating so they might make grander gestures, but certainly you have to uh, have sensory intelligence in terms of holding the rib cage open so that you have that instrument going, but also remembering, using your memory about what rehearsal, how rehearsals went, the little changes that you made that improved the performance. And certainly for expression, we need that creative thought so that you can actually be the character that you're discussing or expressing the sentiment of the text. Okay, now how does this process, uh, thought process apply to theatrical production? When you have a group of actors on stage, do you want them thinking about, oh, my next line is going to be, or do you want them living in the moment? In, in a performance, yes. in the moment. Uh, and the, how do they the do that and still remember process, their lines? Well, that, that's what the rehearsal process is for. And so, um, unfortunately, the, the, when audiences come and see a, a theatrical production, they're only getting that end product. They're not, they're not seeing the, the weeks or sometimes even months of work that is going into coming up with a, a cohesive production. Mm -hmm. And so kind of like what Christy was saying, and even Tom too, we, we need to look at each of the, the elements and know what tools to work with at any given time. Because when you think about it, we're taking a, an artifact, a text given to us by a playwright, and so we have to use script analysis and analytical literary criticism to figure out what that text is telling us. But ultimately, we have to bring it up on this stage and make it a three-dimensional interactive production that an audience is going to emotionally connect with, hopefully mm -hmm. emotionally connect with. And so being able to, to process all of that and find all of those elements and bring it all together, there's a lot going on in a performer's head or a crew member's head to making sure all of those things come together. But when you're on stage and you're in that moment, I, I, I think you have to be 100% 100% present in that moment. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you're thinking about it, you're not actually there. In the audition process, say someone in their 60s is trying, gets the courage up to, to try out for a community theater role. There, what, what can an older, what can a person who's been around for a while, 60s, 70s, who's lived life, ups and downs, uh, to what degree can that interpretation of a dialogue come through via their own life experience? I, I, I think it's it, it immeasurably important because what, so for every person, I, I'm constantly telling my students theater is a collaborative art. And so having those different perspectives come to the table is just going to enrich the overall process. So when someone is auditioning for you as the director, mm -hmm. you're not looking for a perfect read. No. You're looking for some soul. Yeah, ab oh absolutely, yeah. And, and, and that's something else that I'm constantly saying. I don't, I don't really care about what your experience level is. I can, I can work with you. I can teach you technique. I can get you to where you need to be for a production. I want to see that you're, you're willing to put your heart into this and that you're going to commit to it and that you're going to be expressive and that you're going to be engaged mm. and that you're willing to work with the rest of us and, and embrace that collaborative nature. And to what degree does that also apply to your discipline, Tom? If you have someone, a mature adult, who is coming to you, and you know, I, I always wanted to, to learn how to be a sculptor. I mean, to what degree is their life experiences being expressed in that work of art? Oh, I think to, to a large extent. And, and in what ways? Where might we see that in the piece of art? It has to come out of play. 
Um, you got to let go. Got to let go. And, and uh, in visual art, uh, we call it artwork. You know, there's a theatrical play. We play an instrument. But uh, in our language, we use the word work for art. It's an artwork, but it has to feel like play. If it feels like play, you're on the right track. Um, I would say stay away from incandescent lighting, uh, blue lights, right. screens, uh, turn those things off, and just be with the materials and try to play with them. Uh, because the creative process doesn't run on a train schedule, so to speak. Uh, you have to kind of wait for it. Yeah. Now, you brought some of your, a lot of the uh, artwork here on stage is uh, from Tom. This is one of the first ones you were explaining to me before our taping. The man with the hat. What is this all about? Well, I, I just, I juxtaposed uh, images that I found pleasing to myself. I've always been fascinated with the men's tie because that is the place that uh, businessmen uh, uh, get to show the patterns and the colors. Everything else is pretty much neutral. And I'm, uh, I, like, I love doing portrait busts. Did the uh, blacksmithing, got into blacksmithing, and played with it. I just, those were just pieces lying around, and then they fell together. Uh, if, that's the way I would describe it. If I, I felt like if I were working towards uh, an idea, say, well, I'm going to make one of those uh, tie men running, and then try to make one of those, I have less success than if I'm playing with the materials with a knowledge of how to work the materials and the elements of design. And the design. But before you began this work of art, did you have a concept in mind? Did you, were you visualizing what the finished product was going to look like, or did the product unfold halfway through the exercise? What you just said, yeah. It does. It, yeah. That's kind of scary, though. Playing, Playing with the material. I mean, it would, it, would, it would be intimidating for a new, a new art student, I would yeah. think. Um, actually, what I've heard is, uh, please let me play really? with these materials. There are rules. OK. <laughs> there are rules. You've got to play by the rules, but you're still playing. You've got to feel like you're playing. And this piece here, the ear, explain that to me. It started out as a landscape, and then I turned it vertical, and I was approached by a number of hawk moths many, many, many years ago, and totally, I've never forgotten that. So I just, I did this painting a couple of years ago as a remembrance of that close confrontation with nature. And again, I wasn't thinking of the, the, uh, the hawk moths or the ear in the beginning. You it, weren't. It came out of the process. You know, Christy, a lot of people are attractive to um, cr the creative arts as a means to maybe escape from the world have some private time, do something alone. But creative arts also draw us together, don't they? Certainly. It works both ways. It does. And you can be a musician and, and do your own thing, even if you sing in the shower. We discredit that. But certainly that's self-expression, isn't it? The, what you're choosing to sing, whether you're singing something higher than you usually do or lower than you usually do. You're expressing yourself in one way or another. Are you stretching yourself? The song that you choose to sing is expressing your thoughts, your mm -hmm. feelings at the time. So whether we choose to be soloists or whether we choose to be part of an ensemble, and we have three ensembles here, so it's really a wonderful way for you to bring your own experiences, your own talents, your own abilities, whether you know you have them or not, to try them out in an ensemble. That's a very safe environment to be able to do that. And it creates such a sense of community, I would say, in, in so many ways, because it's kind of built into the musical system. If you're an instrumentalist, you may be uh, a woodwind player or a brass player or a percussionist. And you know, so there's a little camaraderie in those various subgroups. But the same thing is true for singers. So you may be a soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And they kind of group together. And I find that in rehearsals, too, that even though sometimes I have what we call sectionals, where we really do just practice that particular part, it's interesting to see how they interact with each other. And we have uh, community members here in our, in our choral group as well. And as you mentioned, I'm, I direct that group. And 
it doesn't matter what the age is. We have a great range in ages we have had since I've, since I've started here. And it's really interesting that they kind of help each other out. So well, I try to remove When you're directing myself. an intergenerational group of, of, mm -hmm. of, of choral members, how does that enrich the presentation when you have these different life experiences coming together? Yeah, it's Can it's you hear really that wonderful. in the music? Absolutely. What's, what's really great about the performance, and this is really the reason that we do it, we spend so many times, as Tom, Thomas was talking about, in rehearsals. And that's like a different beast in itself. The rehearsals take on the workhorse. That's the workhorse part of it. And we kind of dissect different pieces and then when it comes to performance that's the only time for us because we have one concert where it comes together instead of several nights of performance but the one night when we have this performance that comes together we have older people we have younger people we have brand new freshmen who come in they are it's not just a group of freshmen or sophomores they are looking to our older uh, community members to say uh, how is it I'm supposed to act here? How am I supposed to be feeling about this? And they really are bouncing off of and learning from the older people and the excitement and the, com the sense of community and uh, what a wonderful sound that we create when it's not just us, but it's us with others. Mm. You know, uh, Thomas, you do a lot of work here in this particular theater, the Fine Arts Theater. When it's empty and you're walking through it at night, Love it. What do you feel? Oh, it's um, it, it sounds a little cliche, but I, I, it's potential. It's just it's um, I, I think of it as a canvas. It's something to um, it's an opportunity to explore. I mean, this when you look at the theater, when it's bare bones. I mean, there isn't aside from your wonderful you know art presentations here. Um, uh, you know, we're not in the middle of a production here. We're getting ready for one, though. But it, yeah. it's sort of like it reminds me of an empty canvas. Yeah. I think in terms of an empty canvas and the energy that must be brought to the stage here when you're in full production. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of sad because, uh, you know, theater is kind of ephemeral. We end a production and, and we tear it all down. But after we tear it all down, we paint the stage black, un a uniform black. And there's something about seeing that uniform black that is just absolutely beautiful to me. And it's because it's... It, it, it's resetting for the next mm. opportunity. Mm. It's resetting for the next show. Mm. And as sad as, as it is to see a production close, um, it's, it's just as invigorating to anticipate the next one. And Tom, as a, as a teacher, I know teachers oftentimes have challenging days. When the day's done and you're walking through your studio and it's very quiet, how does just being there make you refresh you again, put you in a better frame of mind, just walking among your own I still hear the echo of the students uh, talking about things and, really? uh, and working. In an open studio, uh, the students talk to each other about the work that they're doing, which is a really great thing. And I, I can kind of hear the echo in there after that. And, and Christy, um, music, how does it put you in a different frame of mind after a particularly challenging day? Well. When I have, we use the same stage here. So when, this, when the performance is over, it's, it's the same thing. It's a reset. It's a reset button. And we don't know that we'll have the same people for the next time, you know, for the next semester. We just don't know. But for me, one of the things that I have that's uh, rather unique in our fine arts department is that I have another colleague who runs our jazz program, and he's a professional musician. He plays every week in Chicago. So to know that when I'm done, if I have a challenging day and our groups have met and it's, it's a draining day, I know that he's going to pick up the baton and he's going to take the instrumentalists then and then pick it up again and start that energy rolling all over again so it just never stops. The energy never stops. Wow, and it's passed on. And I know that and you, you have written extensively about the discipline of theater and how theater calls upon us when we're engaged as playwrights, as performers, as directors, even as audience members. Yeah. We're called upon to give it our best attention and give it us our best efforts. Explain that to me. So uh, it's, um, 
there, I, my undergraduate writing professor, he always made a, a very clear distinction between art and entertainment. He said that art should challenge our values, while as entertainment reinforces our values. And not to say that one is better than the other, but that's kind of how he distinguished it. Um, and theater exists in, in that overlap, that liminal space between the two. And so I do feel it's a responsibility for all participants in a production to accept that challenge, that artistic challenge. So I'm, I'm selecting shows that are gonna make audiences think, but it's gonna challenge us as we're going through that as well. So um, I, I want my audiences to enjoy our productions, but I, wanna, I want them to leave with a question. I want them to inquire about the material in a, in, in a different way. I want them to, um, engage with themselves and who they came with in, in, a, in a different way than when they're leaving than when they came in. And sometimes I'm more successful in that and, and others, that's the artistic process. But it's, it's about moving, moving the needle just, just a little, maybe, maybe just for a moment. But if I can get somebody to think, if I can change just one person, either in the production or in our audiences for just a moment, and, and it makes things better, Mm. Um, which is, of course, ar arbitrary. And if we but, can apply that discipline you just described to us uh, in theater to our everyday lives, no matter what we do in life, the world will be a better place. It'll be a wonderful think. place. Yeah, just think. Just get outside of yourself for a moment and just think about what this thing is giving to you, whether it's a piece of music or a piece of visual art or performance. Mm. It's, Thomas, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much. Christy, we really enjoyed uh, your expertise and your thoughts on creative arts. And Tom, your studio, again, sounds like a wonderful place. Thank you for, uh, you've been a wonderful host here during our visit, during our dialogue here at UW Sheboygan. Continued success to you and to your students and to your ongoing outreach in the community. I'm Mark Segrist. Thanks for being with us. And we hope you join us again for our next Next Avenue community conversation.